Hang on. Okay. I apologize for the slow start, but let's get underway. And welcome, of course, to this, the third and the final lecture on the uh, public-private partnerships. It's a pleasure to be with you again, uh, representing my organization, the Adelaide Alumni Research Network, and of course, working in conjunction with MILE. The first lecture in this series, as you might remember, looked at the principles of PPPs, and I'll just briefly summarize the basics again today. The second webinar looked at the experience of PPPs, case studies, and common problems. And the lessons we learned there are illustrated this afternoon when we look at the PPP decision itself. Today we ask, what is the state of the art method for deciding if a PPP arrangement is superior to the traditional method of government ownership of public infrastructure? Now let me start, as I always do, with the key messages that go with that answer. And the messages are these. PPP decisions are complicated. Uh, that point was clear as a matter of principle in the first lecture, and it was evident in the case studies. The most important point is to master the details of the project. Once the details are understood well, there are tools and there are rules to help with those elements of the decision that can be quantified. And I will explain those tools and rules during this lecture. It's the whole point, really. But please be aware that, and I quote, there are no commonly accepted fiscal and accounting fiscal accounting and reporting standards for PPPs. Now that's true, no commonly accepted standards, even though there are in regions such as Europe, there's the Eurostat standard, and there are in many nations detailed guidelines about the accounting procedures. The primary tool is the accounting device called the Public Sector Comparator, which I shall refer to as the PSC. It provides a framework for assembling the quantifiable elements. It gives you a systematic approach to the complications and uh, its use is supported by some simplifying rules. But it's important to stress, and it's a key message, that there are elements in the PPP decision that cannot be quantified. This is where the need for judgment arises. We cannot bring the PPP decision to a conclusion simply by adding up the numbers. Judgments are required and judgments require authority and so advisors can only highlight the issues as we'll spell out below. And finally, let me add that AARN can provide support in working through the elements of the PPP decision. We have partners with the relevant skills. We have our own rule-based PSC and we can guide you through the analysis supported by our advisors, all of whom have deep experience of PPPs. Okay, in terms of the outline of this lecture, what I'm going to do is begin with a very short reintroduction to PPPs, useful for anyone who was unable to attend the previous lectures in the series. Then we're going to focus primarily on the public sector comparator, the PSC. We will consider its four components in detail and in order. And we will spend some time on the concept of risk. That's going to take up most of the lecture. And throughout, I'm going to refer to a simple illustration of a, of a project to build and operate a 600-bed hospital. Now, this is a, uh, an example, an illustration that my team has uh, developed in detail um, as, a, as a means of illustration, and we can give you the details on request. Um, I will then describe how to use the PSC's tool developed by the AARN, and I will finish by stressing what has not been included in the PSC, uh, again, emphasizing the qualitative issues and the need for judgment. Okay, so let's very briefly review the PPP concept. What are they? PPPs are long-term contractual arrangements between government and a private company to provide public infrastructure. The private company is usually a joint venture of uh, construction companies, financiers, business service providers, and sometimes government organizations itself. The private company is usually set up specifically for the project, and so it is called a special purpose vehicle, an SPV. Now, PPP arrangements can benefit both governments and the SPV. The benefits for the private party is that it receives payments for the infrastructure. Either the government pays them directly, or government allows them to charge prices for public access to the infrastructure. And some PPPs are combinations of both forms. Of course, if the payments exceed the SPV's costs, there is a profit to be made. The benefit for the government is that the PPP arrangement can reduce upfront costs of infrastructure. Instead of government paying for the infrastructure to be built, 
it pays the SPV for building it. And sometimes government can also uh, pay the SPV to uh, operate and maintain the infrastructure. In all cases, the ownership of the asset will revert to the government after the contract is over, and that is usually after a long term, perhaps 20 or 30 years. So the, the PPP arrangement reduces upfront payments from government, but it commits them to long term payments to the SPC, and that process can create a net gain for government if the SPV can manage the project, especially some of its risks, more effectively can the, than can the government. And the payments that make the profits are only to government. In other words, the gain from the PPP arrangement is shared between the SPVs, between their profit and the budgetary gain to the government. In essence, under a PPP arrangement, governments moves from the provision of assets and services to the supervision of the private sector doing the same. In other words, government does not own and operate the infrastructure, instead it focuses on ensuring the quality and the quantity of the service provided by that infrastructure. Now, let's consider the public sector comparator. A public sector comparator is what it says. It is a means to compare the case of public sector undertaking the project with the bids governments will get from the SPV under a public-private partnership. The PSC allows us to estimate the costs of the government owning the infrastructure, assets and or providing the service. And undertaking the PSC analysis is the next step. Once we have detailed the infrastructure design and the operation, the next thing to do is assemble the quantitative uh, data using a PSC. Then once the PSC calculation is made, we are ready to go out to the private sector. We will get their bids which reflect their own assessment of the costs, the risks and the benefits of the project, and we add to them the estimated value of the risks that we have not transferred to them but have retained in the government sector. Then we are in a position to compare the two alternatives. We can see the full costs of going with either arrangement, and we will, of course, favour the arrangement with the lower costs. But remember, there are some elements that are unquantifiable, so the choice cannot simply be based on the PS calculation. It is a necessary step to take, but it is insufficient in itself. In essence, the, SPC, the, the PSC is a means of arranging all the detailed estimates for provision by the government sector. That means it needs detailed information about the total cost of public provision for each year of the life of the asset and allowing for the risks of things going wrong. We can conceive of the comparisons as two stacked bar charts, as I show in this next slide. The left-hand bar shows the costs if gov the government goes ahead and builds and operates the infrastructure by itself. The right-hand bar represents the cost to government if it goes ahead with the PPP arrangement. The right-hand bar has two components. The amount uh, the SPV requires to be paid, as indicated by the bid it makes to the government, and the value of the risk that is not transferred to it but is retained by government. The more complicated part is the left-hand bar. As I said, it represents the costs that are incurred if the government undertakes the project, and it has four elements. The so-called base cost under public, service, uh, public, public sector delivery. These are all the costs of constructing and operating the infrastructure asset. The second element is the so-called competitive neutrality adjustment. It takes account of tax exemptions or subsidy provisions that apply only if the government undertakes the project. And the third element is the value of the risk that can be transferred to the private sector. Of course, if the government goes ahead, these risks are not transferred and are but are kept in government. And the final element is the value of the risks that are not to be transferred the private sector even if the SPV undertakes the project. These risks must be borne by government whether it uses the PPP arrangement or not, and so it is in both stacked bar charts. So in terms of our example, our illustration of a 600 bed hospital, uh, the base costs would include the construction costs, or the concrete, the glass, the steel, uh, but it would also include the costs of the medical and administration, administrative equipment that need to be purchased, uh, 
the cost of operating the hospital, both medical staff and its administration, and the cost of maintaining the hospital across the whole length of the life of the hospital. So all, the, uh, all of these need detailed estimates for each year of the project, and we must then add them all up. You can imagine a very long list of money values all added up. But importantly, as some of these costs are in future years, they must be expressed in present value terms. In other words, their numerical values showing money amounts must be adjusted to take account of the fact that money spent today is more valuable than money that must be spent in future. The adjustment is performed by using an appropriate discount rate, which is used to reduce the value of future costs. And the choice of an appropriate discount rate is critical as I will explain below. Once government has estimated all the costs of building the hospital without a PPP arrangement, it issues a request for tender document to the private sector. Government does not need to know what costs the private sector faces. It simply can assume that the private sector bid will cover all of its costs and provide also an adequate expected profit. So government simply adds to the bid offer the expected cost of the retained risks, and then we have the full comparison. And the advice which we give to government is based on this quantitative assessment, um, and it's simply a matter of comparing the height of the two stacked bar charts. Okay, they're the basics. Let me summarise them algebraically. We have the, the equation at the bottom, the public sector comparator, um, is a sum of the net present value of the base cost, the cost of service provision. Uh, uh, there's a competitive neutrality adjustment, the CN term, and then there are two risk terms, the transferable risk, TR, and the retained risk, RR, and the, the uh, public sector comparator is the sum of those four elements. Let's go through each one of them, uh, the first one being uh, the present value of the base costs under public sector delivery. It's easy to define. The base costs are the net costs of building and operating the asset over its life. And when I say net costs, I allow for the possibility that the hospital might earn revenue, so there may be revenues and costs. However, in this lecture, I will make the simplifying assumption that the provision of public infrastructure is a public good and its services are provided at no charge. That just makes it easier to talk about. I need now only speak of the costs to government. But note that SP, uh, SC models, including our own at, at AARN, allow for some revenue items to be added. Okay, with that out of the way, um, while this base cost element is easy to, to define, it is hard to collect all the information needed. Again, this is about the detail of building and operating a hospital. Considerable work is needed to generate information about these base costs. Now, as I have said, the net present value calculation requires that future costs be discounted. This is necessary because a cost of one dollar incurred today is worth more than a cost of one dollar in one year's time. And that is because if one dollar were invested today, it would earn a return so that the future one dollar could be repaid and the interest earned could be retained. In other words, spending $1 today means foregoing the interest that could have been earned by saving it. So the discount rate reflects those foregone, foregone earnings. It's, they reflect the opportunity costs of spending the money now. In other words, the simple discount rate is the rate of interest that could have been earned with that money. The discount rate is further adjusted to reflect the risks associated with the project. In other words, if we think uh, of a rate of interest that would apply to an investment that had no risk, for example, a, a bond backed by a creditworthy government, that's a no-risk investment, then we would add to that an allowance for the risks involved in our project. I will explain how to do so below. But essentially, risk is taken into account by reducing the value of future costs by the sum of the risk-free uh, rate of return and the allowance for risk. So in year one, the numerator is the value of the costs. The denominator is one plus the rate of return. In year two, it is the value of the costs divided by one plus the rate of return raised to the power of two. In year three, 
the denominator is raised to the power of 3, etc., etc. So in general, we have the equation which I've shown there on the slide, the net present value calculation. The second element in the PSC uh, is to adjust the raw present value figures to take account of the tax exemptions or subsidy provisions that only apply if government undertakes the project. This is the so-called competitive neutrality adjustment. This element adds up the taxes that would be paid by the private sector if a PPP arrangement is used but not paid if government builds and operates the hospital. And it also adds the costs of any subsidies that would be provided to the government if it undertakes the project but would not be available to the private sector. So on the tax side, the government's payments such as sales taxes on materials, taxes on labour incomes, taxes on private profits, all of which would be paid if the private sector goes ahead but not if the government goes ahead. So for example, if government builds a hospital, it does not need to pay sales tax on the concrete needed for the hospital. That appears to make government provision cheaper. But if the private sector undertakes the project, they will pay most of that sales tax. They will pay that money to the government. And that, of course, would add to government re revenues. So it makes sense, if we're going to get a balanced comparison, it makes sense to add to the PSC the tax payments that would not be made if government went ahead with the project. In effect, if government builds the hospital, these taxes are not paid, and that is a cost to government. The competitive neutrality adjustment uh, to deal with any subsidies that apply only if government undertakes a project is much the same as on the tax side. So, for example, uh, if government builds the hospital, the costs might be less because other government departments provide help with the engineering design at no cost. That is an implicit subsidy and it would not be paid if the private sector undertakes the project. But it is a real cost to government. And so it makes sense that any additional subsidies that would only apply if government undertakes the project are added into the PSC calculation. So that competitive neutrality adjustment keeps the comparison even. Once we have made the CN adjustment, the actual costs of the alternatives can be compared. Now, I want to take up the most difficult issue of all, the matter of risk and how it is added to the PSC. Risk is the central and most problematic part of the PPP decision process and it affects project value. The more risky is the project, the lower is, it, is its expected value. So the riskier is the project, the less likely it is to be undertaken, no matter who undertakes it. But risk also affects the SPV's bid. The riskier the project, the lower will be the bid by the SPV. So the riskier the project, the less attractive seems the PPP alternative. The focus here is on the PSC calculation, on the government side of the calculations. And, and so we are focusing on how risk affects the costs of government undertaking the project. When risks are realised, they obviously will impose costs on government. So what we need to do is uh, include the expected value of those risks in the PSC calculation. Now, risks are central to PPPs. In fact, many uh, commentators see PPPs as primarily arrangements uh, to do with the transfer of risk. The idea is that the private sector has a different ability to manage risk from the public sector. And that is where the benefits of PPPs arise. Uh, PPPs can be seen as, and I quote from a source, uh, seen as a form of risk management allowing the management of risks by the party best able to handle them. Now, how and why the two sectors, the public and private sectors, vary in their ability to manage risk is a, is a vast and an, and an uncertain subject, and I won't go into it in detail here today, but it is enough to say that they are different, and therefore good negotiations should be able to assign risks to those who can deal with them best. So sometimes the PPP solution will be a net gain. And not only a net gain, but a gain to both parties, a win-win arrangement. In other words, government 
and the SPV can both gain if risk is correctly identified, valued and assigned. Now dealing with risk is problematic because the treatment of risk is complicated. The theory itself is complicated and the practice of transferring risk is even more so because, and I quote again from one of the commentators, risk transferred in theory may not always be risk transferred in practice. And because it is complicated, dealing with risk becomes a way in which problems arise and transparency is compromised. For example, one researcher reviewing PPPs in health and education in one particular nation commented that, and I quote, the function of risk transfer was to disguise the true costs of the concessions, of the PPP concessions. Now, what I'm going to do here today is just briefly outline the conceptual issues um, associated with the concept of risk and then identify the best approach relying on some effective simplifications. My exposition is going to avoid many of the complications and but further details, all the details are available from the AARN. The first point is that risk is it's treated twice in the PPP decision. Firstly, as I indicated above, risk is part of the present value adjustment. Risk is incorporated into the risk premium associated with the discount rate used in the P present value estimation. Um, this adjustment reflects the risks associated with the project itself, no matter who undertakes it. In other words, each project has inherent risks which are independent of who manages it. The second way in which risk enters the PSC analysis is, again, as I identified above, that specific risks can be identified and valued and some of those risks can be transferred from one party to another and that would give us the TR term, the transferred risk term in that stacked bar chart. And of course some risks are retained by government and that is the RR element the last of the elements in the PSC, as I said, uh, appearing on both the bar charts. Now, <clears throat> I would explain the uh, both treatments of risk in the following two slides, one slide for each uh, treatment. But firstly, I've got to explain to you some of the basic concepts. There are two kinds of risk. Firstly, there are systematic risks that apply to the project itself. For example, there are risks associated with building a hospital. Systematic risks would include matters such as risks in the development stage, the risk of failing to get environmental or planning approvals, the political risk that government would change its mind before the project is underway. Then there's risks uh, that are uh, pertain to the construction stage, the risks of materials failing to meet specifications or the risks of unforeseen engineering problems adding to costs. Then there are risks in operation. For example, the risks of IT failures in clinical activities or the, the risk of food poisoning from catering, etc, etc. These are systematic risks, they are risks associated with uh, a particular project. But there is a second kind of risk and these are the risks that can affect the project but are associated with the economy as a whole. Um, there are uh, <clears throat> also risks. Um, these are also the kind of risks that are associated with, for example, a global recession or a calamitous natural disaster that had a global impact. And these are the so-called non-systematic risks, not associated particularly with our project but with other matters surrounding it. So non-systematic risks are those you would incur even if you had a diversified portfolio of assets. Uh, systematic risks are those you would incur on this project alone non-systematic risks are those you would face on any project. Let's translate that into our illustration. Imagine an SPV bidding for a PPP project to build the hospital. That SPV firm has the special purpose of investing in this project and this project alone. It does not have a wide range of assets which could be used to diversify the risks of this project across a number of industries and a number of projects. So it cannot protect itself from the systematic risks by diversifying its asset portfolio. So the SPV must carry the systematic risks of the project and we can expect the value of these risks will be added to the SPV's bid. 
However, it is equally true that if government undertakes the project and does not use the SPV, it itself must then bear those systematic risks. So we need to add the systematic risks to the PSC, just as the SPV will add it to their own costings. Now we measure systematic risk as the extent to which the expected returns on this project do not follow the expected returns on a diversified portfolio of assets. Now most often the performance of the stock index is used as a proxy for the performance of a diversified portfolio. And the rate of return is the so-called market rate of return. It is the rate of return free of the risks associated with our hospital project. The degree of correlation between the expected returns on the hospital project and the returns on the stock market as a proxy for a diversified portfolio is known as the covariance of return. The covariance of returns on our project and those of a diversified portfolio is called the project's beta value. If beta is greater than one, it means project risks are greater than the risks to the economy as a whole. So the likelihood and size of a general economic downturn, for example, is likely to be less than the likelihood and size of a downturn in this project. In other words, this project is more risky. If the beta value is less than one, it says that the project risks are less than for the economy of a whole, that this project is less risky than average, less risky than a diversified portfolio would have. Now, most it's important that most public infrastructure projects have beta values that are less than one. As we know, PPP projects are long-term projects um, and they um, have low risks of overall failure, low risks of bankruptcy of the, of the government, for example. Um, and so they have risks associated with them which are less than those associated with the stock market overall. The last point to note by way of introducing the theory of risk is to make the distinction between two major ways to measure risk. The first is called the, is the so-called expected value approach. Using this approach, we value the risk as the product of the costs of that risk being realised and the probability of it's being realised. For example, let's say our hospital project has a 2% a chance of a $50 million loss from failure to meet environmental requirements. And it has a second risk, a risk of a 10% chance of an $8 million loss if the opposition parties win the next election. They've indicated that they don't favour the project and would cancel any contracts. So what does that mean? It means that the expected value of our project has now changed. It's changed by the sum of the products. So 2% of $50 million, $1 million, and 10% of $80 million, $8 million, the sum of those $9 million is the reduction in the project's value because of these risks. That is one way. The alternative is the so-called certainty equivalent value of the risks and it gives quite a different value. The certainty equivalent is the amount of money the SPV would be willing to pay to be certain of avoiding the risk. Now studies routinely show that the expected value of a risk will be less than its certainty equivalent. In other words, the expected value is less than the value people would assign to get rid of a risk. In our example, the estimated value of the risks is $9 million. It is highly likely the parties involved would pay more than that to avoid the risks. Now many uh, commentators, many of the more sophisticated accountant uh, and, and commercial minds think that the certainty equivalent is a better measure of risk, but it will definitely add considerable complications to our estimations. Uh, and so it is simplified in the manner that I will explain below. Now those points are simply introductory. Uh, risk, as I say, is a complicated matter, but with those points in mind, uh, let us now consider in turn the ways in which risk enters the SPC uh, calculation, beginning with how we can adjust the net present value assessment to reflect the project's risks. Now, risk affects the present value calculation and can be reflected in two ways. Uh, the first and most common method is to use the so-called risk premium approach. Then uh, the risk premium approach affects the denominator of the 
uh, present value calculation. The alternative uh, is to adjust future costs so that their raw values include their risks. Uh, the alternative affects the numerators of the calculation. But because it, that is less common, what I'm going to do is uh, begin to, by explaining uh, the first and most common, the risk premium approach. Now, the risk premium approach increases the rate at which we discount money in future compared with money now. When this approach is used, the risk-free discount rate is adjusted by the amount uh, shown in that equation, beta outside of ERM minus RF, where a beta again is the covariance of returns on this project and the returns on a diversified portfolio. It's a measure of the systematic risk of this project. ERM is the rate of return on a diversified portfolio, such as we might expect if we invested money uh, across a whole number of shares in the stock market. And RF is the risk-free rate of return, uh, that is the rate of return we might expect if we, we lent money to a, uh, uh, on a, a bond issue to a, a solvent and creditworthy government. Now the way to interpret the adjustment is that the term inside the brackets is the difference between the expected return, reflecting the risks not associated with the product or project, but pertaining to the economy as a whole, the, the risks associated with a diversified portfolio, minus the rate of return that would apply if there were no risks at all. If you like, it's kind of the net rate of return expected to be earned from a portfolio of diversified assets. And, and so it reflects the non-systematic risks that distance is then difference that is then adjusted by the degree to which the risks associated with, associated with this project do not track the risks to the economy as a whole. And that is the beta value, which as I explained before, rest, represents the value of the systematic risks. The product of the two is then added to the cost of capital if there were no risks. So that is by far the most common way of um, approaching it. As I said, the alternative approach is to adjust future values themselves to reflect their risk. So then we keep using the risk-free rate of return as the discount rate, uh, and we adjust the numerator terms in the present value calculation. So we would add not the cost of concrete, but the expected cost of concrete, which reflects the risks that its price might change, or that we might have under-specified the quantity required. As I say, this is a less common approach. What is critical is that we do not make both adjustments. Now it sounds simple because the long-term nature, but because of the long-term nature of these contracts, some risks are an implicit part of current prices. So for example, this can occur if suppliers are asked to quote prices for a long period ahead. Uh, the price quoted, for example, for a concrete in two years' time is going to reflect the supplier's estimation of some of the risks uh, that pertain in the period between now and then. And if we capture risk by adjusting the discount rate, that is the denominator, then we are in danger of double counting the risk. Again, this needs detailed consideration in particular cases. All of that is complicated. Let's say that the basic parts are in mastering the details. Once that is done, you will be pleased to know that there are some common simplifications to incorporate provisions for risk. Let me explain. The first simplification is to ignore the issue of the expected values versus certainty equivalents. In other words, to adopt the simpler expected value approach, even though, as I say, some commentators think the certainty equivalent is a better measure. The second simplification is to adjust the discount rate to reflect risk, uh, as I explained above, and not to adjust the base values. Um, again, that is not without its complications, uh, which need to be investigated in each case. The third simplification is to use a discount rate that is an adjustment to the government's current cost of capital. The theory says, adjustment uh, proceeds from the risk-free rate of return using the equation I've just shown you. And that really is the way we picture the private sector operating. But the practice in making the uh, PSC calculation 
is to start with an interest rate that government would pay if it raised the capital and then to add an amount to that which reflects the extra risks associated with this particular project. So state-of-the-art procedures include, for example, the experience of the UK government. It knows the cost at which it can borrow, about 2 or 3 percent real uh, per annum. Um, but it decides when using making a PSC calculation to use 6 percent of the required rate of return on typical infrastructure projects. And when I say typical projects, I mean projects with low to medium risk. So that gives it a rule of thumb, simply use a discount rate of 6% and, and has a rationale to it. The fourth simplification that is most often used in PPPs is to estimate the project's systematic risk, that is its beta value, using simple rules. The theory says we need to collect data about the rates of return on projects of this kind and in our case of, of hospitals. Um, and then we compare the rates of return on hospital with the rates of return for the stock market as a whole. And we calculate the covariance and that gives us the project speed of value. The practice is simpler. The practice is that we simply assign beta values. As I said, typically these values are less than one, reflecting the generally low risks with infrastructure developments. Let me give you an example of the case of the Victorian state government in, here in Australia. Uh, it assigns a beta value of 0.3 you know, if the project is an accommodation project, for example, if it's building offices for a government department, uh, that reflects the very low risks involved. Uh, if it's a water or a transport project uh, undertaken, a public infrastructure project, uh, it's assigned a beta value of about 0.5. And as we go up towards the more commercial and telecommunications projects, we're talking about a beta value of about 0.9. Uh, so for example, our hospital project would be assigned a beta value uh, between that of an accommodation uh, and a water transport infrastructure, so in between the 0.3 and 0.5 uh, level. So all of those simplifications help. The remaining matter to deal with is the possibility of transferring some of the risks to the special purpose vehicle, to the private sector. Let's just have a look at how that is dealt with. So uh, the step is to determine the values of risks that can be transferred to the private sector. Uh, the basics of the situation are that the total risks include the transferable and the non-transferable. If government were to want to take the project, it would bear both kinds of risks. So the PSC includes the values of all of the risks. But if the SPV undertakes the project, the government uh, costs are reduced by that transferable risk, the value of TR. Uh, but of course, RR remains, uh, again, on both sides of the equation. Um, <clears throat> now there, uh, there are some simple steps to be undertaken in dealing with risk transfer. Uh, they're simple to state, but unfortunately, uh, they're often difficult to undertake. Let me go through them. Um, we, again, we have to master the details. The understanding of risk can only come from mastering the details. Um, but then we go through a, a series of steps. The first step is risk identification. Uh, there are a few generalizations I can make here. Case by case work is needed. But it is common uh, for governments preparing a, a PSC to use expert in each field to uh, advise them. Uh, typical processes will mean getting uh, experts together, uh, making benchmarking comparisons, uh, brainstorming sessions, workshops, etc. Uh, from this work, a risk register is created. The second step is to undertake a risk assessment using quantitative techniques. Uh, for example, we can do sensitivity analyses. Uh, this means allowing one uh, independent input variable to change and see what happens to the PSC calculations. In other words, vary the probability or the impact of an event of the risk and see how sensitive is the PSC calculation to that change. We can do more sophisticated uh, risk assessments. We can look at scenario analyses. Uh, in this case, we would change not one, but multiple inputs at once. Usually, the, the analysis creates three scenarios, an optimistic, a base, and a pessimistic scenario, and it forms an estimate by weighting the options, uh, weighting the base case uh, generally most highly. 
there are other more, even more sophisticated analyses uh, using the stochastic mathematical techniques. We can do a probabilistic analysis. Um, they involve using not an expected value for a risk, but a probability distribution function for each risk. Uh, the expected value is then the mean of that distribution. And there are mathematical techniques that allow us to combine the probability distribution density functions for all input variables to create probability estimates for output variables. Uh, they have become quite complicated, uh, but they're quite powerful techniques. Um, and of course, as always, there will be qualitative techniques because not all risks can be quantified and there are some risks which we are simply going to have to list for decision makers um, and consider their consequences without actually quantifying them. The third step um, is a risk allocation step, uh, and this is the critical point. This is where negotiations come in with the uh, private sector, and it's where uh, negotiations with the potential SPVs assign identified risks to either the SPV or to the government. This step will determine the risks transferred and the risks retained. And here, let me refer you back to some of the common problems associated with PPPs as we discussed in the second lecture. Uh, for example, the problem of demand risk and who should hold it is a very common problem. Uh, it might be one of the major issues to be discussed with the uh, SPV bidder. Finally, government needs to consider how the project risks can be reduced. A risk mitigation strategy is required for each significant risk. In each step, it's important that government get advice from those with a track record in the kind of project being considered. Okay, now that completes the exposition of each of the components of the uh, PSC. Let me now summarize what is required of a PSC tool, such as the one that we use at the AARN. A PSC tool is really just an elaborate spreadsheet-based calculator. So it lists all the costs for each year of the asset's life in a large array. Each row is a cost item, each column is a time period, usually one year. The PSC tool has add-on bits that allow us to vary some of the parameters. We can adjust the beta values uh, and the elements of the discount rate. We can adjust each item to make the competitive neutrality adjustment. And we can add to all of that the additional calculations of the expected value of each risk and whether it is transferred or not. The tool works simply uh, and the complications are in providing all of the necessary inputs. My team at the AARN can define the inputs that are required for our model and they can advise on how some elements can be estimated. But I stress again, none of this is much value unless the details of the project are understood. And let me add that the AARN can provide comprehensive services on this issue. We have a, a broad global spread of people and we can uh, put some of our partners on the ground to assist you if you, if you want help. We have strong procedures at our head office in Adelaide to ensure quality control and we have uh, experienced affiliates who can provide us with expert advice and input. Okay, the last point to make in this series is one that I made in the very first lecture, that the quantitative advice encapsulated in the PSC is incomplete. There are often critically important, important qualitative issues. These need to be considered systematically, and judgments about them will need to be added to the decision implied by the public sector comparator. Some of these are matters which lie in the realm of morality. For example, if we build the hospital, we improve people's lives. But in order to build the hospital, we might need to move a town market used by small-scale local farmers. So we would be imposing costs on those with little ability to afford them. That could offend our sense of what is fair and just. The point I'm making here is that how much emphasis to give to that issue is a qualitative assessment. It stands outside of the scope of the PSC. It requires judgment. Other qualitative matters are important from an objective point of view, but they are unquantifiable with any reliability. For example, if we build the hospital, we will enhance our reputation as a city, uh, as, as a city with first-class infrastructure. That can attract skilled people and that can help other industries. It, I'm really making a general point here that there are 
complementarities and synergies that emerge with major infrastructure projects. These are the so-called combinatorial values, the values that lie in the combinations, in the relationship among things. And these uh, are these values, these ones in, I've alluded to here, uh, a reputation effects, are they significant enough to make the project desirable when it might not be on a net uh, basis without those benefits? Again, that is a matter of judge for judgment. As a final example of qualitative issues, the probability profitability of a new hospital is affected by the pr presence of other older hospitals. If governments consider a PPP arrangement, the SPV might, and often does, seek to insert clauses that these other hospitals will be progressively closed down. Whether that is worth the gains of having the new hospital uh, built under the PPP arrangement is not a matter for the PSC calculation it too can only be resolved by the judgment of those with the legitimate authority to do so. Okay, that brings me to the end. The, the final point I will, I will make, if you will allow me, is to just introduce my team. Here we are in my office here in Adelaide. It's me on the left, obviously. Uh, Michael Kahuko from Kenya, Daniel Del Duca from Argentina, and Baha Forgani from Iran. They make up our team. If you want any further advice, please contact us at, at aarnglobal.com and we'd be very happy to help you. Okay, Ali, that completes what I have to say. I'll hand it back to you for some questions, I hope. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Paul Chapman, for a very interesting presentation and rather for a series of presentation. And we really want to thank you for taking time to deliver all these uh, presentations. Folks, we are now open for question and answers. So if you have any questions, you could either put it in the question box or you could raise your hand. There's a hand icon available on your console. So if you click on it, uh, I will be able to unmute you so you can have an audio conversation. Let me go. We have a first caller raise a hand, but I'm not sure. We have uh, Ms. Durga, Dur Durga Aniapan. Durga, can you hear us? And could you please introduce yourself and ask a question? Uh, Durga, can you hear us? Uh, let me go. I believe you have some technical issues. So let me go to the question we have on the box. Sir, you have stressed the need to consider issues that cannot be quantified. Can you give an example of where this was not done uh, and the consequences? Yes, Andy. Let me. Um... There's a, a very nice example from here in Australia, in Sydney, Australia, where a PPP arrangement uh, by government to, to, to build a tunnel. Now, um, in the negotiations over that, uh, the, uh, uh, the government agreed to close uh, certain roads, um, which was important because it, it would direct traffic to the tunnel and improve its profitability. Um, but over the course of the project, you have to remember these are long-term big infrastructure projects with powerful flow-on effects. The tunnel itself changed the pattern of development in the surrounding suburbs and the, that plus the growth of, of Sydney um, put all sorts of pressure on the, the roads above ground. The tunnel was working perfectly but the roads above ground became congested. Now government in the end decided to, to open those roads. Now, of course, if this had not been a PPP arrangement, it had just simply been a government-built tunnel, the government can open and close roads as it pleases and will do so when these qualitative issues, these relationships among things, um, have unexpected results. But because this was a PPP arrangement, that qualitative interrelationship among infrastructures, and among, among road uh, decisions, um, they... Uh, they became a, a legal matter, a matter of, of controversy, and, and uh, the, the matter went to court and, and uh, high legal fees and um, a, a damage to everybody's reputation. What I'm really saying is that, that these infrastructure projects have powerful flow-on effects, spin-off effects. Uh, understanding those across the full length of the, the breadth of the, uh, the project is often very difficult to do and that can cause all sorts of problems. So it's one of the downsides of a PPP arrangement, the, the qualitative, unmeasurable uh, aspects. Thank you very much, uh, 
We have another one, interesting one. Uh, what about the new trend of engaging citizens to take decisions pertinent to public importance? More or less governments are now experimenting governance through social media to build public consensus on infrastructure buildings and other areas of importance for public. Now that is a very interesting idea, isn't it? And it's it's quickly emerging to the the notion of social impact and how we might um, we might uh, arrange uh, contractually uh, enter contractual arrangements to to promote social impact. Look, I think this is a, an important part of the future. Um, uh, it goes to the the detail of the planning of projects. It also goes to the detail of, of risk. Um, I think what we we are learning is that big public infrastructure projects require uh, the inclusion of many voices. It's not simply a matter of planning departments and and the private sector proponents. I think that's a very interesting idea, and I think it is one for the future. Very important. It's going to be an increasingly important part of PPP decision making. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another one. Uh, You've said that some risks are transferred to the private sector and some are retained by the government. Are there any risks that are typically retained by government? Mm. Oh, yes. Ali, I, th I, th I think um, there are a whole host of risks that, that sit within the political sphere. And what we do know from experience is that, that the private sector is very unwilling to take on the risks, uh, the political risks. Um, so. Generally speaking, uh, the uh, PPP arrangement include clauses that absolve the uh, SPV from any of the consequences of, of political decision making. Um, and that's highly understandable, um, but it, I think it makes an important point. Political risks are sometimes major risks within a project and they cannot be generally be transferred. But in general, I mean, there are a whole host of uh, risks that are associated with uh, a, a loose or inadequate specification of outputs. If governments uh, cannot specify outputs clearly, then that raises risks for uh, the SPV, um, which are often unacceptable. Um, and so uh, ill-defined objectives uh, become, uh, the consequences of those become risks that are necessarily borne by governments. Okay, we have um, another one from if I can pronounce the name, Chidi Izawa, the question is, PSC integrity depends on data. However, in many developing countries, data on costs, etc., is often unreliable and in inaccurate. What is your advice in constructing PSC in such situations? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I do take the point. I, I, as I've stressed repeatedly, the, the detail is critical. Uh, specifying the detail, even if we're just talking about the quantity of the materials, is often difficult. But when we come to prices, I do take the the point made by the um, the question. There are a number of you know approaches that are commonly used. Benchmarking is one of them. Um, let's collect data from more than just the, the one nation, neighbouring countries, comparable nations. That can be done. Um, there are also various tops-down approaches we can take. Uh, you know, we might take imported uh, materials as a, a, a point of comparison. Uh, what is the cost of imported concrete, um, and uh, work back to uh, reasonable prices for locally supplied materials. There are a number of techniques, and not none of them are fully satisfactory. Um, I will point out, though, that this uncertainty uh, applies to both sides. It applies not just to the government, but will also apply to the planning by the SPV, and these are therefore uh, risks that get associated with the base costs. Um, um, we've really got to, these are, quite frankly, non-systematic risks applying to a nation, and they, they should be kept separate, but, but they are going to be there as additions, but they're kept separate from the the de dealing of risk that I've spoken of pertaining to the project itself. I also point out, um, Ali, that, that uh, we've got to be careful we don't double count risk here, um, and that's why I make that distinction between the non-systematic risks that would apply to prices of anything in future in, in some uh, uh, countries, 
they are they are non systematic they're not particular to the project but we we would need to count them but keep them separate from our analysis of systematic risk well that really brings us towards the end of the webinar dr paul chapman uh, thank you very much i really want to thank you on behalf of the medina institute for leadership and entrepreneurship for taking the time to deliver this webinar and all the webinars in the past that you have done. It's been quite an engaging and interactive sessions. Any concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss out? No, Ali, I would just like to say how much I've enjoyed it. I think it's um, it's been good for our team to kind of sharpen our approach and, and consolidate what we do. Um, and I will invite anybody, please be in touch with us. The, the, the young people that I work with are, are charming, clever, uh, and very helpful. So please, if you need any help, be in touch and we'll be very happy to speak with you. Thank you very much once again. I really want to thank you on behalf of the mile and thank you all of those who participated in this webinar. We are recording it. Please stay tuned to webinar.mile.org to learn about the upcoming webinars and equally to access the webinars archives. With that note, I would like to end this webinar. You all will be automatically dismissed out. Thank you very much. You all have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling from. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.